I start the recording or will you start? I, I started recording? already. Okay, perfect. So, good morning, everyone. Warm welcome to participants and speakers, Paul and Dirk. We are very, very glad to have you with us this morning. We kick off for a new edition of um, the webinar series Safety, Security and Defense, Def Defense Dimension of Space. Today we will look at the role of SME in the value chain and um, sector of defense. And we have um, as invited speaker Paul Anzius from the European Commission and um, Dirk Bolving, who is the CEO of the Center of De for Defense, Space and Security, to share with us uh, their views. And I like also to give later to some of our members um, the floor to share their views or to say something about uh, their organization. Um, maybe I see new names and faces in the audience. I say maybe quickly something about our network, NEREOS, which stands for Network of European Regions Using Space Technologies, and about the webinar series. Um, our network is a network of regions that's the level next to the state um, the the federal state we are working currently with 23 regions across europe and uh, 34 associate partners associate partners are um, uh, university academia research organization industry we have Airbus amongst our um, associate partners sme regional networks and clusters and the focus and the key mission of our organization is to spread the use and understanding of space technologies, space technologies in terms of space-based data and space-based services. We work with region on the one hand to um, uh, maintain, entertain a public political dialogue with relevant organizations um, to highlight the regional dimension of space. Another aspect is that we offer regions and their stakeholder a platform to partner, network and cooperate interregionally. It's a, um, a very important uh, aspect of our um, network co cooperation to mobilize ESA and EU funded model projects where regions can experiment with space and learn more what they can do. Um, we work on outreach promotion of space really to um, channel into the region new ideas and new opportunities. We work with regions together to get space, the use of space, the dimension of looking at space as a tool for policy making and for economic development um, into their regional and economic strategies. Another important point is also information. Um, we organize regular um, online and physical sessions to uh, um, inform our members about EU projects, programs um, and uh, funding instruments so they can they are in a, in a good position to participate and to share knowledge and wisdom and get active at an EU level. Um, we set up a, a, a webinar series um, following the difficult period of the pandemic because we learned it's a very effective way to stay in touch with our members and also to reach out to new members. And um, we have at the moment two series. One is dedicated to the um, safety security dimension of space, looking what are the programs, what are policy developments, what are strategies from the European level, um, how can we better involve and empower regions to participate in that. And another important um, second series of webinar is dedicated for education training, especially bearing in mind that this year is the years of skills. 
Education and training is a vital um, uh, 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 prerequisite to really participate in space programs, better benefit from the value of space. Um, you can find both webinar series and we record them always on our website. Um, we will share with you in the chat the, the link so you can have a look. You can have a look at the previous edition of the safety and security dimension, as well as what we do in the education and training domain. Now, with this, I move to um, our first speaker, Paul Ansius. Paul, you will speak to us and um, share with us a bit the view of the Commission on, on, the, on today's webinar topic. Let me briefly introduce uh, you, because this is also what um, our members are always interested in the speakers, like what are, what is their profile, what, how, how uh, we have many people amongst our members that are building space career and they are always very interested to learn um, what backgrounds do the people have who work in space. And your profile is very, very vivid and uh, diverse. Um, you are since 2012 um, the responsible policy officer in uh, DG DEFIS and the European Commission um, for defense industry. You are in charge of the European network of defense related regions. Um, you are also in charge of the European Defence Fund and you do outreach and SME support. Um, you have a, a, a background in political science and uh, previously to the Commission you had managerial positions in the software, IT, media and pharmaceutical industry. Um, I find very interesting that you worked so long in the defense sector and you can really see the development of the last uh, 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 10 years. And uh, there we are very, very interested to um, have your presentation. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Roya, for this kind uh, introduction. And indeed, uh, uh, I have been with the uh, DG Defis, let's say first DG Grow, where I worked on, on the defense industry since 2012, and then DG Defis, which is still a, a, a recent uh, department within the Commission. So I, I saw firsthand how the topic of defense um, was growing over the recent years, uh, culminating, of course, then with the uh, first uh, instrument at our disposal, the European Defence Fund. And so let me take a moment to share my presentation with you so that I can talk about the role of uh, SMEs in the defence um, ecosystem. So I'm going to share that in a moment. And please just tell me when it's visible for you. Can you see it on the screen? Yes, yes. Okay, that's great, thank you. So my idea with my presentation is first to give you a little bit of information on how we see the role of SMEs in the defense uh, ecosystem, then highlight some of the challenges that these companies are uh, facing before highlighting uh, some of the opportunities that are being offered under the European Defence Fund to these companies. And then I think it's worthwhile uh, paying some attention to the role of SMEs when we talk about uh, innovation, and then also what we are trying to do from the Commission side to foster innovation and to help SMEs grow in that uh, respect. And at the end, I just want to put some questions on the screen that may help and that may facilitate uh, our further uh, discussion. What you see here on the screen is the German Leopard 2 tank. That's, that's a battle tank that um, is getting a lot of press coverage these days, as you surely have seen uh, when the uh, journalists talk about Ukrainian uh, battlefield. And maybe just to start in a very light uh, way, uh, a, a little pop quiz question. How many uh, companies do you think are involved in the production process of this battle tank? So 
I suggest uh, just put uh, any thought you have, any number you can think of in the chat, uh, allowing you some some moments to do that. And maybe because I can't see the chat uh, now, I only see the presentation, maybe Margarita, if you can just um, indicate to me some of the figures that people are, are guessing. So we monitor the chat for the moment. Um, 50, Anna 50, then Veselin Vasiliev 400 plus. So there is a quite a difference. <laughs> okay, 50, 400 plus. Anything else? Just make mm. a guess. 1000 plus 150, 800 from Klaus Volving. Okay, okay. Thank you for that. Um, so it, I think the 1000 is the closest to um, the reality today because wow. 1,500 1, companies are involved in producing this uh, tank. And most of these companies are indeed um, SMEs. And I think that's a nice transition to talk a little bit about um, the structure of our defense industrial supply chain in Europe these days. As you may know already, um, the defense industry in Europe is concentrated in five countries. I mean, it's France, Germany, uh, Italy and Spain and Sweden. So they account, let's say, for the major part of the turnover. But if you look at the entire defense supply chain across the EU, you will find up to 9,000 companies in uh, the EU 27. And on top of the pyramid, uh, not surprisingly, you will find the prime contractors, the uh, system integrators, they represent like 2% of uh, uh, the sector but they earned the dominant share of the revenues. So here we're talking obviously about players such as Airbus, uh, Naval Group and, and Dassault in France, Navantia in Spain, uh, uh, Leonardo in Italy, uh, Rheinmetall in Germany and so on. If you go below that, you will find a, a large number of companies, mostly SMEs, many of which are in the business of delivering uh, uh, components and services to support the needs of the primes or tier one contractors. Now, I think this is a part of the picture uh, because there are also SMEs that are not working for primes, for example, but they prefer to deliver their products and their services directly to armed forces or more specifically the defense procurement entities of the member states. I think we also have to bear in mind that in this sector, uh, we usually talk about SMEs that are active in both civil and defense markets. Yes, there are a number of companies that are working exclusively for defense, but that's not the standard. Most of them have a kind of a dual use uh, market or dual use approach. When we then turn to, let's say, the challenges, um, I would say that SMEs that are active in defense or that want to become active in defense, I mean, they tend to face the same challenges as any other SME, but on top of that, they are facing some challenges that are more specific because of the defense sector. Um, if you look at access to information, access to procurement, you will see that, you know, already identifying business opportunities is a challenging thing for an SME, but in particular, if you want to sell your defense products, for example, to other member states than where your company is located. Uh, procurement procedures tend to be different from one country to another. Already the information on the opportunities, it tends to be available only in the national language. So you have this kind of barriers that you have to deal with. Um, if you look at access to finance, uh, there are plenty of, of barriers there that sort of exceed the ones that you will encounter in civil sectors. Um, like limitations in the lending policies of, of many financial institutions, but also other limitations that are really sort of more specific to defense. The fact that you depend on, on single clients usually, um, sort of a long return on investment, um, the uncertainties that are related often to defense programs. And then also I would say the sort of asymmetric uh, payment relationships that can exist between uh, large system integrators and subcontractors, and also um, an increasing use of uh, risk partnerships that can 
sometimes put an additional burden on, on SMEs. What you also see is sometimes a lack of harmonization of the regulatory and security requirements. So that involves usually transaction costs for companies. Um, it involves certain risks that can be like an additional barrier uh, to the participation of SMEs, to the cross-border cooperation uh, of SMEs, and also to attracting innovative companies that are uh, coming more from the civil side. And then you have, um, uh, specifically in area of defense, the access to the supply chain, where usually you have this really national focus um, on the defense supply chain in the different countries. And you also have usually uh, concerns uh, related to intellectual uh, property. Now, from the side of the European Defense Fund, um, European Defense Fund is, of course, there to uh, uh, promote, to foster, to support projects that are looking at research and development and, and uh, are going for cross-border cooperation between different uh, entities coming from different countries. But there is, of course, a need for the European Defence Fund to be inclusive. So we want the EDF to provide benefits to countries from all sizes, to companies from all sizes, so also the SMEs in particular. And also one of the objectives is to encourage the participation of SMEs and, and other actors that are not active in defence yet. One way of trying to attract the SMEs to the European Defence Fund are the so-called non-thematic calls. Uh, it started already in 21. It's continuing now with the calls that are open now. And for example, there is the call specifically for development actions for SMEs, where only SMEs can be part of the consortia. Uh, and where there is, a, of course, a limit of, of a subcontracting uh, per beneficiary. but there already 36 million euro is devoted to that and a similar amount is going to a call that is looking at research actions with the difference that for this type of calls also research organizations can play um, an active role and then there is the call that is looking at disruptive uh, technologies um, which is not let's say designed specifically for smes but it's particularly attractive for smes and um, let's say it's also a bit easier in the sense that you don't need a minimum of three entities but already two entities from two member states or norway could form a consortium and this is a call uh, where 16 million euro has been set uh, aside. Apart from, let's say, the specific uh, uh, non-thematic calls that are attractive to uh, SMEs, there are, of course, other built-in uh, incentives in the European Defence Fund. I mean, there is uh, a possible bonus that depends on increased, uh, that leads to an increased funding rate, depending on how many costs are allocated to non-cross-border SMEs or to cross-border SMEs. So that's one way of increasing your funding rate. But also if you look at the award criteria, specific attention is being given to the participation of SMEs, but also uh, mid-caps. So that are some built-in incentives to attract SMEs. And one can wonder, is it paying off? Is it working? So let's have a look at uh, how we're doing uh, when we look at the outcome of the EDF projects in 2021. I mean, there we had 60 projects materializing in total. Um, the total amount of money from EU side was 1.2 billion. And we saw that 700 uh, uh, entities uh, were taking part in the different uh, projects that were uh, selected. And if you then look into the SME participation, uh, close to 300 entities were SMEs, so that's like 43%, uh, obtaining 18% of the available funding. What is very interesting, though, is that if you look at these uh, 300 entities, we see that, yes, one quarter is indeed uh, to be found in these non-thematic calls that I highlighted before, but 75% can be found in the other calls, the more thematic calls, which means that also these calls can be very relevant for uh, SMEs. It's not only the calls that are 
more designed for the SMEs that are relevant and uh, yeah, important. Um, I also want to pay some attention to uh, innovation because SMEs can really be considered as drivers of innovation and that is also valid in a sector of defense. And it's increasingly getting important, more and more important to capture SMEs that are up until now maybe mainly active on the civil side of economy and try to attract their innovative powers, their uh, technologies they're developing and look for potential defense applications. And the way I want to do that is just to highlight this through a concrete uh, example. This is an example of a Dutch uh, small and medium sized company. And they were already in the business of uh, delivering high tech materials for Formula One cars. So as you can imagine, you need materials that uh, allow for high and durability because you have extreme circumstances and so on. And this company had an interest in diversifying its markets and they were interested in going towards defense, but they had honestly no clue on how to do that. How, how do you approach um, uh, the defense sector, how do you deal with member states, with, with primes, uh, if you don't have any experience at all. The way they did it is that thanks to a matchmaking activity of the Enterprise Europe network, they were able to find their way to one of the research communities managed by the European Defense Agency, the so-called CAPTEX, of which you may have heard in previous uh, events or in previous experiences. And that kind of matchmaking allowed them to meet with defense primes. And what they learned is that one of the defense primes said, look, we have a specific problems. If we look at our helicopters, our military helicopters that are landing in the desert, uh, we are obliged to change the rotors of the helicopter after every two landings because of the problems with the sand. So that's a huge cost, as you can imagine. They tested out the technology developed by the Dutch SME, and they found that after the test, uh, the rotors only need to be changed now after every 10 landings. So that's a huge cost saving. And I think it's, it shows the impact, um, uh, the application of a civil technology on defense uh, can have, but it also shows the role and importance of even one single SME when it comes to uh, innovation. So it's very important to uh, provide a framework to, to facilitate this. And this is one of the reasons why we started with the European Defense, Defense Innovation Scheme that we launched uh, a while ago. And I will not go into too much detail because I am fully aware that this was one of the main topics that you dealt with in a previous event, but um, I, I just want to highlight that uh, it does envisage to help uh, up to 400 innovative SMEs uh, every year, drawing, drawing to a large extent on EDF funding, but in different ways. So all the way from step one, as you can see on the screen, uh, when it starts with an idea, how can you capture that? Uh, how can you facilitate that, you know, through technology challenges and hackathons, then testing out the idea with the help of uh, innovation networks, and then further uh, bringing maybe the civil innovation closer to potential EDF funding through so-called spinning calls, helping with the financing part. And then maybe I'll say a little bit more about the fifth building block because the uh, measures, the support measures developed by EU, this, you could say they're not exclusively designed to help SMEs. Some other companies may benefit as well, but they tend to be very important for SMEs. And some of the actions really have a clear focus on SMEs. For example, the fifth building block that you see is about finding partners and networks through matchmaking and so on. And what we're doing now is to provide, for example, business coaching to SMEs that are part of uh, the uh, non-thematic calls uh, that I've shown you before. So we are starting with um, uh, 2021 projects now. So the SMEs that are part of those non-thematic calls, they get the benefit of uh, coaching for free. Uh, to help them with their business uh, development. If it's a research project, the coaches may help them to move forward 
uh, from research phase to development and so on. If it's more a development project, they may be helped to think about how can I now get to the uh, markets. So, and it's a very uh, extensive range of services they can get, uh, help them with their business strategy, with uh, legal uh, matters and IP, uh, which is important for them, finding the new markets, finding primes, uh, and so on. All the different aspects uh, are covered. And of course, with a specific focus on the specificities uh, of uh, uh, defense. So it's now a matter of weeks before uh, we will launch uh, a website, uh, which will be interesting, first of all, for uh, potential coaches, because we will be recruiting a number of the coaches online through that website. And that's information uh, that uh, everyone is, is free to uh, spread around as soon as it becomes available. But then also it will be an important website in particular for the SMEs uh, that will be able to benefit from those uh, services. Um, now, there are other networks and measures that we have developed which uh, can help SMEs in particular. Uh, you may have heard about the national focal points. Uh, this is a network that has been uh, launched uh, uh, like uh, a year and a half ago, where uh, contact points have been nominated by the member states and by Norway. They are being supported by the member states and Norway, and it's a system which is very similar to the national contact point system that you may be aware of already under Horizon, which means that any company, but also university, uh, a research institute, and so on, they can all turn to their national focal points, uh, which are there to provide them with information on the European Defence Fund, how does it work, what calls are open, um, uh, what are the eligibility conditions, and so on. Um, can you help me with the uh, search for potential consortium partners and so on? And in some cases, the national focal points will tell you, well, what you're aiming for is maybe not to be found under the European Defence Fund, but there are other sources and other networks that may help you further with your project ideas. So you see the link to the different national focal points um, that exist. Apart from that uh, network, there are, of, co of course, other tools and networks that may help SMEs in particular to find other partners. Um, I already mentioned the Enterprise Europe network, which of, of course is the largest uh, business support network even in the world um, that is there to help SMEs, uh, help them to develop their business, to find partners. And yes, they can also do something in the area of uh, defense. You can turn to your local uh, contact point and uh, ask them, uh, how can I find uh, other partners in other countries? It could be for, with the aim to take part in a project under the EDF, but it could also be just to find a business partner, uh, just to find someone who is working on the same technology, who, who would like to work with you, uh, to find other clients and so on. They have an extensive um, database, which is very, well maintained, very active, uh, and so that can be used. But I would recommend to get in touch with the people behind it, rather than trying to figure out everything yourself uh, in, on how the database works. They're, these people are there to, to help you with that. Um, I think already the European Network of Defense Related Regions was uh, mentioned before. Uh, I think this is indeed one of the uh, networks that I'm managing, where we bring together different clusters, regional agencies, and so on, um, to discuss with them uh, what is the available funding um, in terms of European structural funds as well, what can we do, how can you uh, sort of improve your regional strategy, how can you integrate your use and defense concepts into your strategy, and that will of course help the availability of funding. Now, as you can imagine, many SMEs know these uh, agencies very well. They are members of many of the clusters. So this is, again, an important network for us on how to reach out to SMEs. And at all our events, we try to facilitate uh, networking, for example, for these companies. Our uh, colleagues from the European Defense Agency have their own B2B platform, which you can use. And of course, uh, we organize every year now uh, EDF Info Days which are uh, organized in a hybrid way. So they take place here in Brussels, but you can connect virtually. 
and specific B2B uh, activities uh, related to that. But what you see increasingly is that member states are organizing this type of activities also at the national level, and we are helping them as much as we can with that. And what we see is that increasingly, uh, yes, SMEs find their way to these info days and use it also as an opportunity to uh, take part in matchmaking activities. Uh, of course, we are now, as DGDEF is, we try to be present in many of the uh, exhibitions, defense exhibitions um, that are being uh, organized. Uh, recently, there was one in uh, Spain, there was uh, uh, the FEA in Athens, uh, there is now uh, Le Bourget. We, we try to be there with our own DEFIS stand and uh, provide as much as possible information to any interested uh, companies. and we intend to increase this kind of presence. Uh, we are now sort of arriving at the end of my presentation. I just wanted to highlight some questions which may inspire you to, to uh, think about and to uh, provide either me with some feedback or maybe you have some questions for me later. Um, I will, I'm always interested to hear about some of the factors that motivate companies to uh, start developing solutions for defense markets. What, what is really driving you to do that? Especially, of course, uh, if you are up until now sort of exclusively working in the civil sector. Do you have any experience you would like to share when you work with networks, when you work with matchmaking tools? Because if we can improve, if we can uh, help you. Uh, that's always useful to know. And in general, I would say uh, I've highlighted a number of measures that we are launching of, or already have launched to help companies, but maybe there are other measures that you, you think are still underdeveloped or missing uh, in helping you to access uh, defense markets. So always interested to hear more about that. So I've come at the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. But um, of course, we'll have uh, plenty of time, I guess, uh, for your feedback and questions. Many thanks, Paul, um, for your interesting presentation. I open now the floor for questions and comments. Is, are there any questions to Paul? Comments? Okay, maybe if you don't, and I start. Um, Paul, you mentioned that there are five countries in yeah. Europe um, where the, the, the um, SMEs from the de defense sector are, uh, let's say, concentrated. Could you repeat them? Sure. I mean, this is this is France and Germany. This is uh, Spain and Italy and Sweden. Okay. I think these countries all are very uh, well. They distinguish. We have uh, all all of them present on our platform except Sweden, but we have cooperations to Sweden. These are very highly industrialized and specialized countries, and um, all these countries have also remarkable space capabilities and and use space capabilities. What would be interesting from our um, perspective, um, how would you describe um, the dimension of European cooperation in their work? When you say their work, you're referring specifically to those five countries or? No, in, uh, of the work of um, SME in the defense sector. In terms of cooperation, you mean with other um, players? European in... partners in Europe. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think with the what we try to do with European Defense Fund is of course have more cross-border cooperation and uh, in particular then also connect um the SMEs which are maybe also not necessarily in countries in the five countries that I already mentioned but help also the SMEs that are part of the other countries to find their way to cooperation with uh, players in, in let's say, the, the, the five countries that I highlighted. And I wouldn't say that before EDF there was no such cooperation at all, but it is probably still too limited. And we hope that through more and more EDF projects, this will broaden and it becomes more and more like the norm and uh, more and more uh, straightforward. What you see is that uh, uh, the some of the, the, the major companies are now more and more actively reaching out and scouting to find 
uh, these companies, these SMEs in other countries. Um, and I think it is interesting to see how certain countries, uh, some of the smaller countries usually are finding their way and in some cases are developing their own uh, niche, I would say, or, or finding their own specific uh, angles when it comes to the defense industry. Um, maybe not surprisingly, for example, if you look at Estonia, they, they are very strong in everything related to cyber. They were already very strong in terms of cyber for all kinds of civil applications, but increasingly they are being recognized as a very important player when, when you talk about cyber defense, for, for example. So it's not a surprise that a number of these companies from that countries are also now to be identified, uh, for example, in EDF project, projects and so on. So I think that is uh, something that will only uh, increase uh, over, over time. Um, I think for, for us, one of the main challenges is to make sure we are also getting on board many of the interesting or potentially interesting companies that, as I said a couple of times during my presentation, that are still on the civil side and that may have an interest, but are not necessarily fully aware of the European Defence Fund, or they think, well, it's probably very difficult to get in, it's, it's a lot of bureaucracy, it's a lot of paperwork, um, why should we sort of uh, try to go uh, that way? And if I may just continue with that, it's one of the reasons also why we try to um, uh, bring other measures into play, especially the ones uh, that are covered by the EUD scheme, um, uh, which to a large extent are aimed at companies that are maybe not familiar yet uh, with defense, but could potentially really have something interesting to, uh, to offer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We received now a question by Vaseline Vasilev. Kastra, um, have you analyzed who is the typical customer of a defense SME in the EU? Is it um, national? Is it EU and other or non-EU customer? Access to market, to access to customer is a major difficulty for SMEs. No, absolutely. Uh, that, that is indeed a major uh, difficulty. I would say non-EU customers, we shouldn't hide that fact, are in, they are, those customers are important for uh, uh, European companies. I would be interested also to hear uh, what Klaus has to say about that in his experience. But from what I see, uh, we cannot deny that for many companies, the potential or the, the possibilities to, to be able to deliver to um, non-EU customers remains uh, uh, important. And it's, it's not something that we, we are uh, against. That it's not because we are um, thinking and advocating that, for example, European strategic autonomy is important, that we don't uh, want companies to deliver to uh, non-EU customers because it's important for their viability in many cases. So let's not uh, forget about uh, that. One of the issues though, is that uh, if you look at the way that the defense procurement is being organized at uh, the, in the different member states, uh, up to 80% is still being organized at a national uh, level. And that means that also, uh, if you look at the procurement in the, in the member states, they tend to go for uh, the sort of local or national companies um, uh, and maybe not enough going to uh, the potential that lies in uh, some other uh, member states. And this is for a whole range of reasons, some of which are historical, but it's, it's again also one of the elements which we hope uh, the EDF can contribute to, to, to changing, because it already starts there. It's not only about how can I find, as a company in Europe, my way to non-EU customers, it's already like, how can I find my way to uh, my neighbor member state in many cases? And there uh, is, is still a lot of uh, work that could be uh, done. And sometimes it can lie in very easy things, but still, as I, as I mentioned, just the fact that the procurement opportunities in, in many member states are only available in the local language can already be a, a barrier for these companies and in particular, the uh, smaller ones. Um, yeah. Thank you. Klaus, even though you have not had yet taken the floor, 
Um, would you like to uh, um, share your views on the question of Vasily? Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, thank you, Paul, for an excellent presentation. I understood the question like, uh, can we engage companies outside EU and Norway? Was that correct? Um, Vasily, maybe you um, quickly take the floor, if you can, um, say something about your organization and maybe you can clarify how you meant the question. Hello, uh, do you hear me? I hope you do. Uh, I'm Vasily Vasilev and I represent the Bulgarian Aerospace Cluster Castra, which is uh, a, a consortium of uh, innovation-driven SMEs in some universities. So, uh, we have some understanding how the, the technology development works. And my question was most related to the way how to motivate SMEs to develop defense projects if they have difficulties to access the end user, the customer. For instance, Bulgaria, national MODs in small countries, they are not buying <laughs> from uh, local SMEs. So uh, this is why I asked the question, how do you feel statistically in Europe? Uh, where is the market for the SMEs? Is this national in the country, EU right or outside? What is prevailing? Because if you rely on only the national markets in other countries, not on these five top ones, I think SMEs have no chance. They have to be uh, helped to get access to non-national markets. And uh, that one hand, and also my other question I was to, to post it, maybe there is a need to mm, stimulate or motivate national governments to procure more, like especially in the small countries, because we, for instance, in Bulgaria, we don't see any procurement action from the national MOD for innovation uh, defense products. So how EU is going to address on the other side to, to support the national governments to, to be more actively searching for SME products. So there are two sides, uh, if, if I could explain. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, can, I can give my response. I would say uh, in, in Denmark, we all, we were a small state, so the national defense market is not very huge. So, so the issue that you address that we lack home market is actually not such a big problem because the market is so small anyway. And, and I think when you, when you consider the European uh, perspective here, then back in 2012, 13, uh, the European, actually the summit decided that uh, due to lack of uh, defense spending, something else needed to be done in the aim of securing a kind of European strategic autonomy. And that was trying to play all the European member states and regions and their defense related stakeholders well together, bring them together to bring more European defense capabilities. And, and of course, in this past, in this, uh, in this concept, supply chains and uh, security of supply is very important. And uh, because the member states are normally quite good at taking care of the SMEs. I, I, I could imagine that the European Commission really uh, say care for SMEs is not only because uh, they, they, they lack powers in themselves, but also because they're important bricks, they're, they're important players, because when there are so many together, they contribute very significantly. I think maybe 54% of all the defense procurement in, in, in Europe is through SMEs. So, so I, I think it, it's a discussion whether you want to look at the more classical defense industrial players, which provide quite strong supply, security of supply, or you will support to a higher degree uh, the SMEs that cannot deliver security of supply because much of what they're doing is quite innovative and new, and they don't have the robustness either, neither historically, um, market wise or economically. So, so it's a balance of motivating and keeping the member states, uh, SMEs strong and alive, but, but also keeping them in close contact with the, with, you know, the, the value chain that, that Paul presented to us. So it, it's not either or and, and an idea where you, when you see individual defense markets and you deliver only to the Bulgarian MOD and 
our companies to live only to the Danish, that, that would be very much against the original idea of trying to merge the uh, defense ecosystem in, in Europe. That was a long answer, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Klaus. It's also a complex question. It's not, uh, 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 we didn't expect easy answers. So thanks for taking the time and explaining well. We have another question by Heinrich Christler from the European Defense Agency. Um, Heinrich asked, how do you um, ensure synchronization between Cassini and EDF? Well, I think there is a, a, a very good cooperation between, on the one hand, colleagues that are working like myself on, on defense in DigiDefis, but others that are working more on space, in particular the Cassini program. I think, first of all, um, the Cassini program was, because it existed before, let's say, UDIS, for example, was launched, um, it was a, a really a source of inspiration for us. So that's, that's already a, one element of sort of synergies. And secondly, um, we try to be as pragmatic as possible. And for example, as you may have seen, one of the building blocks of our EUD scheme, the Defense Innovation Scheme, is about organizing hackathons. And to start off with, what we did is to work together with our colleagues from Cassini. And so the first kind of hackathons that we organized with a defense angle were about the connection between space and defense. And these are the ones also, for example, that uh, have been taking place this year, but from next year onwards, there will be more specific uh, defense uh, hackathons uh, without uh, 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 an immediate link uh, or without necessary having a link uh, uh, exclusively with with space. So yes, it's it's like a source of inspiration, and we we already started at a very pragmatic level, but we we meet uh, or at least colleagues that are working on the UDIS meet uh, regularly with uh, the space colleagues in uh, to to find synergies to to make sure we work together and of course uh, especially uh, avoid any any overlapping. Uh... Mm -hmm. Thanks, Paul. Um, we received another question by Elisabeth Surgens from the European Space Agency. Elisabeth asks, how would gather that some um, of those markets are classified and need the SMEs to invest in security message such as clearance, physical, IT? This is also costly for them. How, to, uh, how do you help in on this? Yes, I mean, that's that's a good question and there is no easy answer, unfortunately. It's not like there is a support program specifically looking at that, but I do recognize that um, these are uh, costs that uh, can sometimes be an obstacle. I think I mentioned it in, in my presentation, kind of transaction costs uh, um, uh, that are in, in those cases uh, unavoidable. What we... We are, well, maybe two more things. We are exploring uh, still internally on if there is anything we could do from our side. And I hope that will lead to something very uh, concrete, but also in terms of the EDF projects, for example, uh, security um, is, is a very important uh, feature. And as you can imagine, um, in every member state, uh, there are different ways of dealing with uh, security information in particular, there are different platforms that are being used and we see that in the implementation of an EDF project, that can be a bit of a, a, an obstacle, uh, time consuming and so on. What I, what I see, but this is per, my personal impression, let's see if it's confirmed in the future, but I see that from member state side, they also recognize this. And uh, so I think they have maybe an interest in more harmonization uh, of this and in having, uh, more member states using, for example, the same type of uh, systems, and that would help uh, everyone in the end. And I think, at least from a cross-border perspective, if SMEs would be involved later in projects and in member states, we would be using more and more the same systems that will help. But it doesn't change uh, uh, what you what you quite rightly pose in your question, that in the initial phase, um, uh, when a company starts to get involved in projects like that, um, a, a certain cost uh, can be uh, can be involved indeed, um, absolutely. And there is no, at least not from EU side, uh, a clear program that could uh, that could help with that. What we're trying to do, though, is um, and it's part of the EU this scheme, 
is to do something about the financing of uh, uh, SMEs, uh, defense SMEs in, in general. And uh, this we are going to try to do from our side with a defense equity fund uh, so that at least from the investment side into the defense sector, uh, it should become a bit more attractive and a bit, uh, and a bit easier. Um, but apart from that, I mean, that's as far as I could go in my, uh, in my assessment on this, but it's, it's, it's an issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Paul, you had three questions to the audience. Maybe you can show this slide again, and maybe it helps also if you copy them in the chat, um, maybe at a later stage, um, or maybe some people need to uh, think about it um, before reacting. We are very glad to have SME representatives or cluster representatives in our audience and value your experience and your point of view. Um, in not, another point where I have a question to Paul. Paul, you mentioned in your presentation um, on some slides cross-border SME. What is in that context a cross-border SME? Yes, cross-border SME in this context of the EDF means indeed that, for example, if you have a, a, a project and in that project you have, uh, uh, for example, a prime coming from France and you have a Danish uh, SME, that Danish SME will be labeled as cross-border because it's a uh, it's coming from a, a, a country where uh, there is not really a, a prime, but in the project you have French prime, you have a Danish SME. So uh, you bring into the project an SME um, from another country than the prime, to put it in very simple terms. If you would have a project with a French prime, but you also have some French SMEs, those French SMEs, we would not call them uh, cross-border SMEs, but non-cross-border SMEs. I mean, it's a bit, uh, heavy in terms of terminology, but it's important to determine like uh, potential additional funding rates uh, and so on. So we, we really tried uh, to some extent, of course, to have as much as possible uh, cross-border uh, activities also when it comes to um, SMEs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, another point I wanted to refer to from your presentation, procurement features as an uh, 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 important aspect um, of, of the activities. Um, we have this year the, the year of skills and we think, um, we, we work as Nereos, we work a lot with SME. In fact, uh, SMEs are the protagonist in many member regions. And we think education training and for SMEs, it's often like, education training, a capability building, skills development in terms of better grasping and realizing and participating in business opportunities. And um, to see also education and training in terms of educating SMEs of better participating in procurement. And there is my question to you. What's your point of view on education and training? And um, to the SMEs that are present, do you feel your organization, your company is fit for procurement, procurement across Europe, or do you have a need for education and training in the procurement? Let's say from our perspective, of course, skills is, is one of the important policy dimensions when you talk about defense and, of course, especially in this uh, year of the skills, as you already uh, highlighted. Um, in the recent past, we have done uh, quite a lot of activities on that, even though it has to be recognized that skills is a, a field where it's more like the, the member states have the, the most competences. But nonetheless, uh, I think we can play a, a role in, in coordinating, facilitating, exchanging information and so on and bringing stakeholders together. And that's one of the things we, we did with uh, the European Defence Skills Partnership at a certain stage, which led to a specific uh, defence skills uh, uh, strategy uh, consisting of different building blocks where we tried to, uh, from our side, uh, promote a number of measures. Those kind of measures, for example, also include 
how can you, if you look at the different types of funding that exist at European level, have a bit of more funding being made available for defense? How can you make it useful for the defense sector? And that in the end resulted um, in the Assets Plus uh, project, uh, which brings together many stakeholders from defense um, to work together on that uh, with funding from Erasmus Plus. That was the first time um, it was it was done at the European level and uh, it, it uh, was repeated. Uh, let's say the opportunities were repeated uh, afterwards. Um, I think from our side, we tried to work on the different um, uh, sort of uh, problems that exist because we, we also know that there is still uh, a lot of uh, lack of harmonized uh, uh, approaches in this field. We know that there is a specific issue of the attractiveness of the uh, defense sector, which has been an obstacle for uh, many years. And one could argue, uh, what is the impact of the U Ukrainian war? War Is it maybe now a bit more uh, a favorable climate for young people to uh, go into defense related uh, fields or, or not? I, I hear some mixed uh, echoes from the defense ecosystem on that. For some, it's easier now to attract young people, also companies, but other companies told me that the uh, effect of the, the, the corona of COVID was uh, much more negative and, and much more long lasting, meaning that um, younger people want other things in their life now, uh, want to mix up uh, things and are not necessarily um, attracted to uh, the, the defense sector. So they are getting less uh, young people interested in, in that. So um, one of the concrete uh, things uh, that has been, been launched also, um, I think it's a year ago, it's, it's the, the, the Pact for Skills. Uh, it, it was also one specifically for the aerospace and defense uh, ecosystem. And um, I hope that this will uh, lead to more and more specific actions because it has quite uh, ambitious uh, 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 goals in terms of uh, uh, reskilling people, for example, getting people uh, attracted to the defense sector and so on. We'll be doing um, an event on uh, defense uh, skills, uh, skills in the defense industry on the 12th of December in Stockholm. Um, so, and there we will look at different uh, dimensions uh, when it comes to skills uh, for the defense uh, industry. And um, uh, we hope also to gather some uh, interesting ideas uh, from the participants on what could be done uh, more in that, uh, in that respect. Mm -hmm. Many thanks. That sounds very interesting. Where We should keep in touch on this. Um, now I move on to our next speaker, Klaus Bolving. Um, warm welcome. Klaus, you are the CEO of the Center for Defense space and security. Um, your organization is supported by the Danish Ministry of Higher Education and Science, so the education training part, and the Ministry of um, Industry, Business and Financial Affairs. You have a very, very interesting profile. You have uh, uh, strong uh, space capabilities. You um, have an education from the Royal Danish Defense College and, uh, and a background in international studies. Um, and and then there you have to tell me what this is. You have a, um, a master marina and you spent 13 years um, at sea. And you hold before your current position, you held different managerial positions in naval, military, intelligence, security, academics, trade, human resources, and business development areas. You're really a living example how diverse um, a defense can be. Um, we very much look forward for your presentation, really, as someone that has an insight in the sector and daily works with SMEs. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jorge, for this very kind introduction. And uh, yes, now I'm working on innovation and I'm, uh, I mean, Center for Defense, Space and Security. It's an, an official national Danish innovation cluster for defense, space and security. And uh, I will tell you in a, in a few minutes uh, how we operate with with innovation, but what we do is incredibly 
a lot in line with what Paul and Joe have has told us about the approach to defense and de defense innovation. We are not working at the policy level. We are working as operators, eye to eye with the with the stakeholders uh, in 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 our ecosystem, which also to to a wide extent overlap what overlaps what uh, Paul is talking about. Where we we are working maybe a little deeper in operational innovation. So so should we take the next one? Yeah, there are a few uh, facts about Sensec. We we started in 2004 as a more loose network, and then we were established as a full uh, organization with with the board and uh, general assembly and and uh, a secretariat in 2007. And in, since 2014, we have been the national Danish cluster for innovation within defense, space, and security. So we we are authorized by the Danish government. Um, yes, let's move on. You can have the slides afterwards, so I won't tire you with the details. Here you can see the domains in which we work. And um, when you look at clusters, you can see some clusters, they are very heavy on technology. Some are very heavy on markets or application areas. Our most immediate uh, imminent strength is uh, the application area defense based security. Anyway, we do have lots of technology companies and knowledge providers within these technologies as well. But be, but uh, it makes very much sense that we we uh, especially in the defense sector focus on the application area because in Denmark we have thirteen official innovation clusters that cover different uh, sectors. We have energy, we have uh, environmental technologies, we have production, we have healthcare, we, we have different clusters that all have technologies that can be applied to the defense sector. So that's how the Danish uh, innovation ecosystem is organized. There's 13 in, the, in principle independent uh, and, and fully focused clusters on their own sector, but with an obligation to build bridge between each other. And that's where I think we play a, an interesting role now when it comes to cross fertilization and application of commercial or civilian technologies. Uh, the outcome of what we're doing is basically four things. Uh, knowledge dissemination by uh, knowledge transfer on competence development. We talked about skills a minute ago. Uh, we do matchmaking means bringing people together to make new value together. Uh, internationalization is, is a crucial point in a small country where you don't have a sufficient home market. So, so, so the Danish market, the Danish uh, stakeholder system within defense and space, it suits very well to the European cross-border, uh, cross-collaboration uh, uh, philosophy. And then finally, we, we try to gather companies and knowledge institutions to make uh, to, to make a more deep innovation projects that bring new value to the value chain. And you can see in this slide, we have these uh, subdomains and within the space, we have upstream, downstream is just to have, well, it's, they're still huge areas, but to, to at least have a little bit focus and then autonomous systems in the space is what we're working on too. But these sub subtopics, they are changed from year to year in accordance with our members' interest. Should we take the next one, please? Yeah, here you can see our, we, it, it's, it's our innovation model. Uh, I've talked about it many years, but it has, I haven't talked for, for the few last few years, but now it had, it's like it had, has gained new momentum because uh, we see this kinds of innovation concept popping up, growing uh, in, in different levels of matureness in many places in Europe right now. Uh, we have these four, uh, four, four, uh, four phases. The first one is what someone would call market scouting or technology scouting. We are, we are looking at, in the secretariat, we are looking through different networks and articles and whatever is online to see what's coming up, maybe new strategies that define the market area. And, and when we, we think this, this may be interesting for the members or for the ecosystem, 
we we and, and we consider that there can be a critical mass and a and an opportunity for creating new value then we test it with our members or, or also sometimes a much broader ecosystem so so please go to the next slide there's an animation here so so we try to to gather people um from Denmark and abroad uh, in, in the triple helix uh, construction. Triple helix, you know that uh, it, it covers academia or knowledge institutions, and it covers the industry, and it covers the, the governmental actors. And uh, depending on which kinds of market or innovation opportunity we, we're looking at, we try to find the, the national or European authorities that partly put up limitations and rules for working in this area we're introducing. And then we, we also introduce the authorities that has strategies or funding or other ways of supporting innovation within this specific area. And then we, we because we don't really have a, a, a full Danish market, we are so dependent on relations to primes abroad so we invite a, a, an international prime contractor high up in, in the tier, in the value chain, and, and try to learn from this uh, prime contractor. What do you need in your supply chain? And remember when Paul, Paul showed his supply chain, this is the kind of, of thinking we are doing. It is, what do you need in your supply chain? And, and we also tell the, the prime contractor, we don't do sales because the philosophy in our business comfort zone is that we do not meet to take each other's money. We meet to make new money together. And that's the philosophy of innovation processes as a plus sum game. We need to make new, new money together. And of course, the prime contractor, he wants to showcase his capabilities or her capabilities for the end users present there. And and this is but uh, and this is this is fair because they need to to also of course sell their stuff, but also the the present governmental representatives they can be there as a guest, and not with a a clear announce pronoun, uh, announcement that they are looking for specific products because then you go into tender rules and stuff, but they can be there you know without any obligations and just looking for what what's going on in the prime contractor world. So they, they get market insight. And then we say to the prime contractor, we, we expect you to be open to, to upgrade and develop your level of innovation by talking to suppliers, suppliers of products, service, and knowledge that can strengthen your value chain. And, and when we say products, service, and knowledge, then we actually cover all the academia and companies that are present because products are normally pro production, small production SMEs, services may be small integrators, service providers. It may be research and technology organizations that, that uh, offer a lot of business and in industrial service, or it may be universities that uh, have knowledge science that could be applied to, to either directly to an OEM or to a supplier deeper down in the value chain or it could be a private uh, advisor. So, so that's how we try to find out, do we have a critical mass? Do we have a joint interest in playing each other well here in order to, to create new innovations? So if, if this succeeds, you can tap the next one. We, we, will, we will see, and the next one, we will see if we manage to make a very, let's say, positive trust-based, trust -based, um, business comfort zone, people will actually start setting up bilateral meetings. Uh, so, so this is quite good. And, and, and during these network events, matchmaking events, there will be competence developing development by just listening to what is going on. And we will set up individual meetings like, like uh, the European network of the defense related regions are doing business to business, business to government, business to academia and government to academia. And, and, and if this gets really mature, then we may actually create a small group or a subcluster with a specific goal of trying to create some new capabilities for the, for the armed forces or for this space area. So we, we put them, we help them 
go into more deep groups or small clusters where they develop their project idea or service and at the at the end during this process when we have helped them with some mentors some supporters some funding from maybe e european union or from national level or both then at the end you will have reached the end and you have created something that were not there before and that's where you get get the return of investment to the government because the government and eu they invest in this and this is not a competitive business this is a plus some business so nobody loses anything they will only be gaining Let's take the next one. Yeah, so how, how do we do? I have already talked a little bit about it, but how, how have we concretely operated with innovation and value chains in Europe? Let's take the next one. When we started in, in 2013, Paul Anshu, who is the, say the, the founding father of a lot of these uh, new developments in European defense that is going on, I had a meeting with him where I was invited by a European lobby organization, URADA, and, and they said in 2013, the commission will explore with industry taking a bottom-up approach, how to establish a European strategic cluster partnership designed to support the emergence of new value chains and to tackle obstacles faced by defense-related SMEs in global competition. In this context, the commission will use tools designed to support SMEs, including COSME, for the needs of defense-related SMEs. To this end, the use of European structural investment funds may also be considered. The work will include clarifying eligibility rules for dual-use projects. And this actually, it worked, and, and this became a success. So, so this, it took 10 years to create the success that the European Defense Fund has turned to, out to be. I will talk more about that in the next slide. So where is Sensec? We, we are representing uh, Denmark as a member state and region because Denmark is one region in, in the European context. And we have talked, uh, Paul can talk more about the European network of defense related regions, but it, it is covering literally all of Europe, all of Europe's uh, member states and most regions. So next one. We have we have had a uh, co-hosted two two uh, events, and I know uh, together with the European Network of Defense Related Regions, and I know the European Commission is always open to to suggestions. If you have a strength position in your region or member state where you can uh, play yourself well together with the European Commission, so we had the first one in two thousand thirteen with the cross fertilization pot potential between. Uh, drones and and sp space satellite applications and we had the next one in uh, 2021 about the soda of the future in in the same framework so we have done this twice and it is really a strong success because working together with the ENDR gives a lot of political attention but also business and uh, academia attention from the stakeholders next one yeah, that was my 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 mother. She loved this picture because I I had the honor to moderate the launch uh, event of the European Defence Fund, uh, 2021. It was during the COVID, so it was uh, of course online. So it was a quite good opportunity to you know get get more insight in in the processes around this. And next one, and he, here are the the partnerships that I have selected. Uh, we have of course ENDR. There's another partnership that Paul also mentioned, European Defence Skills Partnership, where different uh, stakeholders within the defence area can contribute and discuss, and you can read its web, part, web page. Uh, the European Pact for Skills, we are following this. We're not super active there. Uh, in, and also the aerospace and defence uh, sector part that Paul talked about. We have another uh, collaboration with different security and defense clusters all over Europe, France, Netherlands, uh, uh, Germany. So uh, we are working quite close together there, building consortia for different uh, cluster related EU calls. We are a member of the European Cybersecurity Organization where we co-host a lot of uh, a lot of activities and uh, we are active member of the working group and we were one of the uh, contributors to the European Made 
made in Europe cybersecurity label. So we we have a quite strong profile there, there, and it it is it is with still stronger focus on cyber defense. And then we are part of a North European uh, network of uh, cyber related clusters called uh, North European Cybersecurity Clusters. So uh, this is our, our uh, this, this is the networks in Europe that I like to emphasize. And next one, please. Yeah, we 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 were so lucky. So we won uh, and uh, we won a an EDF project together with. Uh, let's take the next slide, with, with uh, six different uh, members. Uh, no participants from different member states in Europe. It's a research project on on additive manufacturing to the defense industry, and aerospace industry. And and what is a cluster doing there? Yeah, we are doing all the horizontal work, keeping uh, trying to, to to connecting the dots. Uh, Make, making sure that uh, some of the findings that can be shared are shared to the proper authorities and stakeholders in the European ecosystem, so it can contribute to the to the common goal of building a stronger European profile, in general in Europe. But it is a quite delicate area because uh, not only because of, let's say, Russia or other countries espionage against uh, Europe, but also because of the tense situation in Ukraine. Uh, it is. It's quite. Uh, it's it's covered with quite a, a lot of secrecy. So there's not so much open in uh, dissemination we can do. The next one, please. Yeah, we have uh, we have this uh, Roliac project, and we have two applications. We we are waiting for a response. Uh, other EU projects we engaged in is Eileen. It's an, an Erasmus Plus call on skills de development within advanced manufacturing in defense and aerospace industry. We have a COSME project, project called uh, Secure IT, um, making innovative solutions for securing uh, open spaces and, uh, and city areas. Assets Plus, as uh, Paul talked about, it's, it's a kind of groundbreaking project because it was the first real defense project uh, of this character. We have another we have another quite interesting project, Catch for Dual Use, Key enab Enabling Technologies for du Dual Use, where we collaborate with the Estonian and two French clusters to bring uh, SMEs with key enabling technologies to the third country markets. We, and and uh, we, have fo we focus on, uh, on the UAE, on Canada and Singapore. And we have the last one, it was also, uh, it was focused on railway, railway security, where we try to learn from each other in, in the partnership. And in addition, and that might be interesting, we, as I told initially, we are the official Danish uh, innovation cluster for defense, space and security, which means that no other cluster can get public funding for this. Uh, so it is called innovation power or innovationskraft in, in Danish. And, and in addition to that, we, we have got a, a special grant to, to get more SMEs into Horizon Europe projects. We got that from the Ministry, Ministry of Higher Education and Science. But a few months later, we got another grant from the Minister of Defence for bringing more SMEs into the European Defence Fund. So we are running these two projects parallel to get more SMEs involved in the European defence related programmes. And, and in addition, we have through the, uh, through the REACT uh, uh, funding from the European Commission after the COVID, we have used uh, that funding through the Danish Ministry of the Business uh, to, to, to create a defense startup incubator that is growing actually quite rapidly. We, I think we have 15, 20 companies there now. So it was a good opportunity to, to kickstart this. And then the next slide, please. Yeah, why, why, why should a cluster be part of a European Defense Fund project? I have tried to sum up with focus on that. Um, I think an, an obvious task for a cluster in a, in a consortium could be management and organization of the projects and work packages, because the companies that, that are there, they're not there to do management. They're there, they're there to, to get new capabilities. And the knowledge institutions, the universities or RTOs, they're there to, you know, to uh, to transfer the knowledge and, and research into the project, not to do administration. So I think if you have a strong secretariat, and we have, 
we have uh, operated on that in sense that we are 13, 12, 13 people now. So we have, we are, we are capable of running a coordination of a project. So that could be, that could be an opportunity. And then uh, the classical ones for clusters, communication, dissemination, exploitation, including organizing events, doing the matchmaking stuff that, that clusters are quite good at. So that's the second thing that could, could make sense for a cluster to do in, in that consortium. And then generally clusters are quite strong in knowing what is going on everywhere, but without the capability to, to do what is going on. We know what the universities are doing, but we, we do not research. We, we know what the RTOs are doing, but we do not make uh, industrial service ourselves like they do. We know what the companies are doing, but we do not products or, or services ourselves, but we know what they're doing. So we, we have a quite strong capability. Clusters have a quite strong capability to bringing these stakeholders together so they can cross fertilize each other and bring new value in place together. And then, of course, a heavy thing, uh, but but an important thing to do the evaluation monitoring is a typical part of the uh, of the cluster manage you know, of the consortium management, the coordinator role. So, and then, of course, you have to you have to have a name for credibility and quality in what you're doing. Uh, all the stakeholders they must trust you, and and trust is divided in two. The first one is a classical one. It is personal trust. It means I like you and I know you like me. So we agree that we will do the best we can to support each other. That's a personal trust. And then the professional trust. I know you're capable of delivering what, what I need for my innovation. And I know you can support me. You're capable. You're not just a nice guy. You're actually a clever guy. So, so, so these two levels are so incredibly important. And that's why presence, uh, visibility, joining the, the ENDR network activities, joining the EDF uh, info days where, where we are going as well, is, is really important. And try to get involved in projects and learn by, by being there. Thank you. I think I have the last slide now as a goodbye. <laughs> yes, thank, thanks for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, um, Klaus, for this interesting presentation, and we really appreciate it having someone with a really broad overview on what's going on in your country from the SME perspective, but also in Europe. Um, I'd like to pass on the question that um, Paul asked our audience. Um, you work with SMEs, and um, what do you think motivates them? Are you asking Paul or me? You. Okay. With your perspective yeah. as a from the cluster, you working daily yes. with SMEs. What motivates them? Yes. Uh, what motivates them is if they have a business case or business model, and they have a clear view of that, then they can make a gap analysis of the business model. And quite often in the defense industry, what you lack in your business model or business case is access access to the other other chains in the value chain or the other links in the value chain and and uh, at, and an understanding of that that a chain only makes sense if all the links are in are complete and are intact so so if if they can see they know through their network through their experience through their matchmaking and knowledge sharing and whatever they have done that there is a need for, for specifically their technology or their skills in the value chain, then they are motivated because they say, we can do the difference. And then they are also motivated by the related value creation. And that is by being in a consortium with maybe, let's say 10 or 12 stakeholders, you get really acquainted with them. And when you build trust with them, then the trust will often be passed on to their other stakeholders that you don't know, but you get access to them. So, so it, I think one of the strong motivations is one getting access and expanding your network to especially the prime contractors, but all, but also to, to get the funding that can maybe secure that you can hire a project responsible in the SME to do the work in the project. 
Thank you. Okay, we come now to the end of our session today. Um, does anybody maybe feel inspired by a Dirk and wants to uh, react or respond to um, Paul's questions? No? There are no other reactions? Okay, then I think we can close. We thank you for your interest and attending this uh, morning's session. Many, many special thanks go to our two speakers, Paul and Dirk. It was really great having you. We really appreciate it. Um, we will have a next um, a webinar in the same edition of Safety, Security and Defense in September after the summer break. Um, stay tuned, the um, program and more information will be soon available via our website. We will feature today's um, webinar on the website as well. Um, Paul and Dick, I assume you are okay if we shared your presentations with the participants. Absolutely, no problem. Okay, perfect. So, thank you all. Have a really good day and week and we keep in touch. Goodbye.